So I'm here today to talk about sandboxing in Bazel. Um, this talk isn't exactly a migration story, but it starts in what's probably a familiar place for many of you. Uh, I work at a hardware company, Intel, on a team that designs CPUs. And about a year and a half ago, we began migrating an existing code base over to Bazel. So the key motivation for us was correctness. And uh, there are a few interesting things about this code base. One is the um, prevalence of custom and vendor tooling, so broadly just stuff that we could not modify. Uh, another is that the build was heavily coupled to a common compute environment and a shared network file system. This was interesting because it led to a pervasive use of absolute paths in the build, just embedded in tools, scripts, input files, and flows. And this was challenging for us because it, in a sense, kind of negated Bazel's correctness guarantee. So what this talk is really about, in a sense, is badly behaved tools, but more specifically, absolute paths and Bazel. So in this talk, I plan to cover um, kind of what this use of absolute paths looks like in our build, um, why this causes correctness issues, and what this has to do with the sandbox, how we extended the Bazel sandbox to address this issue, and what these extensions look like in practice, and finally, some takeaways for the ecosystem. So first off, as an example of what I mean by pervasive use of absolute paths, here's a short, somewhat contrived bash script. Uh, the salient bits here are that two of the resources that the script accesses, uh, highlighted here, are morally inputs to the script in that they affect its execution, but they're not passed in via command line argument or NVAR. Instead, they, are, they have their absolute paths embedded and hard-coded in the tool. And um, this is a simple example, but in practice, the same kind of issue comes up in some less straightforward ways, including paths in native binaries, tools that arrive at an absolute path by starting at a relative input and then taking its canonicalized path and looking for siblings, as well as um, usage in shebangs and search paths. So to understand why this is a correctness issue, we need to take a step backwards and look at sandboxing in Bazel. So broadly speaking, the sandbox aims to do a couple of things in Bazel. Uh, one is to protect the host system from potentially malicious build actions. And the other, and of more interest to us here today in our discussion, is to ensure that actions actually declare all of their inputs. In other words, that they are correct. So there are several different execution strategies in Bazel that implement some level of sandboxing. Uh, from least to most strict, we have the standalone um, execution strategy. This is pretty much as simple as it gets. It, uh, actions executed this way have unfettered access to the host system. And um, crucially, they are executed with their present working directory being the actual location of Bazel's exec root for the workspace. What this means is that even if your tool is diligent about using relative paths and um, not escaping the present working directory, um, your tool still has access to other inputs that weren't declared as inputs on the action, as well as other outputs Bazel has produced, even if they aren't declared as inputs. So to fix this, um, kind of one step more strict is the process wrapper sandbox. So this uses purely OS agnostic uh, technology to go and um, limit to some degree what inputs actions actually can see. The name of the game here is Simlix. So on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, we kind of have this tree view of what the um, sandbox directory that is set up by the process wrapper sandbox um, looks like for a particular action. So we can see in this case, um, the uh, script that we were talking about earlier is exposed to an action that actually calls it. And uh, what that script file actually is, is a symlink into the actual exec root on disk. So one step more strict from here are the Linux sandbox and the Darwin sandbox. <coughs> so this is when we start getting into using OS-specific technology. Uh, the Linux sandbox in particular uses the same underlying tech as containers, so this is things like user namespaces and process namespaces. So um, the staging strategy is the same as the process wrapper sandbox in that we still assemble symlink trees. The big difference here is that we now have the ability to restrict um, other kinds of I.O., so network I.O., um, kind of communicating with other processes. And uh, crucially for our discussion, we now have read-only access only to the host file system, whereas earlier we also had write access. <coughs> 
So there's actually um, one other sandbox mode called the uh, Hermetic Linux Sandbox. As far as I know, this isn't super frequently used. The big kind of change that this has over the Linux Sandbox is um, it provides selective read access to the host file system. So rather than start with the entire host file system exposed, it starts with an empty root and then selectively chooses to add things in. I'll come back to the sandboxing strategy later. So now, armed with our understanding of how the sandbox in Bazel works um, in some sense, uh, we can turn our attention back to the script from earlier. So what actually is the problem here? Where does the correctness issue lie? So we can take our script, uh, same script, just squished a little bit, and wrap it in a general and actually go and execute it um, in Bazel. And if we do so, it runs um, as we expect it to. Uh, the correctness issue only comes up if we go and actually modify one of those absolute path dependencies that uh, it is referencing in the script. And uh, when we do this, we see that uh, when we run a build again, Bazel actually isn't rerunning the general's action. It's just reusing the same, old, same output. And um, if we force a clean build and then uh, rebuild again, we see that there's different output. And this is what our correctness issue is about. So how do we fix this? The first hurdle is that we need some way to talk about this external dependency in Bazel. We need some kind of way to um, actually identify that absolute path such that we can declare a dep on it. So fortunately, there's a pretty clear answer about how to do this in Bazel. The answer is to use repository rules, in this case, um, the local repository. The way this works is um, conceptually pretty simple. We have some links again. Um, the repo rule constructs a kind of shadow version of the directory being exposed um, and overlays some build files that actually define targets exposing um, interesting contents of the directory. And uh, for the sake of uh, tracking dependencies, Bazel will actually follow these sim links to their canonical paths so that um, it is actually considering their real contents to know um, if it needs to trigger rebuilds and such. And uh, so on the screen here, we have um, a very simple kind of new local repository invocation that exposes the two files of interest for the uh, absolute path from our script earlier. And uh, on the right, we have what the symlink tree that it produces looks like. Uh, so two symlinks and then the build file that's generated. So once we have a Bazel target for these external dependencies, using them is straightforward. Um, back to our general and native binary example from earlier, uh, all we need to do is add the two targets we exposed in this repo as data depths on our native binary. And if we do that, and then we run the same set of commands from earlier, we see that this time Bazel actually does go rerun the action for our general when we change the absolute path for our external dependency. So um, unfortunately, this does not actually mean all of our problems are solved. In this case, we were able to fix this issue because we know about the missing dependency. The point of the sandbox is to preemptively catch these cases. So what to do? Well, the issue at hand is that host file system access wasn't restricted. Earlier I mentioned that there is a stricter Linux sandbox called the Hermetic Linux sandbox that does restrict host file system access. So let's try that and see what happens. Uh, so the first thing that happens is we get errors about bin bash not being able to be found. So we uh, weren't kidding when we said, really, we are starting with an empty host file system. So if we carve out some exemptions for common binaries and shared objects and such, we now get an error about the particular absolute path we're trying to reference not being available. And this is even though we did declare that particular file, or its basal target anyways, as a dependency. So why is this? To understand, we need to take a look under the hood at what the Hermetic Linux Sandbox is actually doing. So on this slide, we've got the Sandbox directory for the Linux Sandbox execution strategy on the left, and for the Hermetic Linux Sandbox on the right. And uh, comparing these two kind of gives us their answer. The salient bit here is how those um, actual files are um, present inside of this directory. So 
script.sh, for example, on the left is a symlink. On the right, it appears to be a file. In reality, it's actually a hard link, which is kind of the, um, the strategy that the Hermetic Linux sandbox takes when it can. And um, the reason the Hermetic Linux sandbox doesn't use symlinks is because, because it is starting with an empty root file system. There's no guarantee that the absolute path on disk that the artifact actually resides at will be there. So if it made symlinks, they might dangle. So fundamentally, the issue here is a mismatch in how the artifacts are being consumed by our script and how the Bazel sandbox is trying to expose them. Both Bazel sandbox um, execution strategies here want the tool to consume the artifact at a relative path within the exec root. Um, however, our script is not doing this. And uh, for the Linux sandbox, this results in us doing an end run around the, around the uh, sandbox. For the Hermetic Linux sandbox, this means that even though the sandbox actually is making our input available, it, um, our tool is not able to see it. So at this point, I'm sure many of you are thinking, this seems super gross. There are tons of reasons not to do this. Why are we putting absolute paths in these places? Can't we just modify these tools to use run files or to take an argument or something? And uh, you're right, this is not ideal. Unfortunately, I don't have a satisfying answer here. In our case, um, the sheer number of tools and other organizational factors made modifying the tools a non-starter. And uh, the use of NFS made a lot of the common kind of uh, concerns about doing this sort of thing a non-issue. Uh, I encourage you, though, to hold your objections for a bit. Uh, my hope is that you'll see some parallels between this problem and the solution we arrive at and other problems that maybe exist in the ecosystem more broadly. OK, so on to the solution. So back to our general and our execution of it with the Hermetic Linux sandbox. Um, we got pretty close to the semantics we wanted here. With the Hermetic Linux sandbox, we're able to control access to the host file system path, but we weren't able to make the sandbox actually expose the artifact at the absolute path. So we can do this manually using sandbox add mount pair, and if we do so, The build actually does succeed, but um, the point is that we don't want to have to do this manually. Fundamentally, what we want is to tie these two things together, expressing the dependency in the build file, as we do on the left here, and the kind of uh, corresponding path being line mounted in um, so that the action can access it at runtime. And uh, this is more or less what our changes to the Hermetic Linux sandbox actually do. So when we execute, or when an action is executed, we search for external symlink inputs in the action, and uh, we kind of traverse these and lower them to bind mounts when executing. The other change that we make is to continue staging in inputs um, in the sandbox directory as symlinks rather than hard links. Um, there are two reasons for this. One is that we now can, because we know that the absolute path that the artifact resides at will be available. Uh, the other reason is that um, hard linking isn't always possible if you have cross um, file system links. And uh, the failure mode is to do a copy. And um, this becomes untenable when you have very large inputs. Uh, so one other detail is um, some link chain. So it turns out that in the course of resolving or canonicalizing a particular path, um, that is a symlink, you may encounter other symlinks along the way. So uh, we actually go and walk the components, um, the path components of a particular input path, um, and record all of the symlinks that we encounter along the way, and then go and reify these, um, or bind mount in all of these um, when executing the action. So uh, in this example here, we have um, a tree view of one of our inputs on the right with kind of a somewhat convoluted, complicated uh, web of symlinks. And uh, after doing this kind of traversal, we end up with uh, five bind mounts we need to do. Uh, the reason we do this, uh, some tools actually seem to care. They will go and um, not just canonicalize a path, but actually walk its constituent symlinks and do things with that information. 
Um, another fun bit of trivia is that we, um, it's actually kind of hard to bind mount a symlink. Um, at least it, my understanding is that it requires um, a flag, which is on screen here, and a fairly modern Linux kernel version. So in our case, we actually just go and have um, our sandbox execution machinery go and recreate the symlink um, to be identical to what it is on the host file system. So back to our general again, uh, the view from Starlark. So it turns out that um, the criteria we set earlier for looking for um, absolute path bind mounts to make, which was uh, external symlinks that happen to be in the inputs of an action, um, new local repository already meets this criteria. So this means that we actually don't have to make any changes at all to the um, build file, at least. Uh, in this case, we can quite literally swap out Bazel for our fork of Bazel that implements the changes described. And this suddenly has the semantics that we want, where um, at execution time, it will go map in the um, artifacts at their absolute paths that are described by uh, those two uh, foo prelude and um, foo frob targets. Uh, on the right is actually a mount map that our um, sandbox execution machinery prints in uh, sandbox debug mode, and um, it kind of maps to the uh, tree that we saw on the previous slide. So uh, a couple of other details. Um, we ended up wanting to support uh, a little bit of extra other functionality in um, terms of how we do mounts, in particular, um, this desire to um, exclude files cheaply and also to uh, handle immutable directories that we know are immutable because we have some kind of out-of-band guarantee of this, like uh, Linux file system permissions, for example. Um, this led us to essentially build something that has overlay FS style semantics, but ultimately lowers to bind mounts. Uh, the key thing here is that um, there's this idea of splatting, which is um, if you have a mount that is beneath another mount, um, in order to kind of reconcile these, you go and flatten the previous mount into its constituent mounts. And uh, the mount maps on the screen kind of show off what's going on here. So all of this is well and good. We have the machinery. We now can describe absolute path dependencies, have them actually be mounted in at runtime. Um, the big question now, I think, is what does usage actually look like? Can we use existing rule sets? How burdensome is listing these steps? Is it practical? And so forth. So uh, first off, I want to say that I think the practical thing to do here is to carve out exemptions. Um, so these are things like your loader, shared objects that are commonly used, uh, probably bin bash, other standard POSIX binaries. And in most builds, this is hopefully a safe enough thing to do. Um, hopefully, the particular bin bash version you're on doesn't affect materially the uh, outputs of your build. Um, but we actually took a different tack here, which was to ask the question, what if we didn't have any exemptions? What if we actually did model all the dependencies used for every action down to the system loader? So this was slightly out of paranoia, but also curiosity. We kind of just wanted to know what it would take. And uh, there is precedent in other ecosystems. So we actually took some inspiration from the Nix ecosystem, which does manage this level of hermeticity with its sandbox. This is actually a quote from the Nix wiki, where uh, I think it describes Basil's sandboxing approach as uh, more aspirational than exact. But uh, that aside, it turns out that in practice, um, I was surprised to find that this is actually fairly doable. So first, the happy path. Uh, tool chains are our best friend here because they provide a nice extension point to go and specify these machine-specific dependencies without needing to hack up existing rule sets and um, in a way that lets us uh, kind of model the platform-specific nature of this stuff. So on this slide, we have a Python toolchain as an example. Um, and the upside here is that uh, once you do this, you can reuse existing Pi binaries and Pi libraries, assuming, of course, that they don't have implicit system dependencies of their own. So 
Um, from here on out, getting things to work is pretty much an exercise in finding implicit dependencies in the Bazel ecosystem. So I'll talk about a few of the bigger ones. Um, shared objects are probably the biggest of the bunch. Um, I think as most of you probably know, there is this kind of shadow binary graph underlying a lot of the binaries we run, at least on most Linux distributions. And um, this is the kind of thing that is painful to model by hand, but fortunately it's very amenable to automation. So the tech we took was to write a uh, tool that takes um, as input binaries of interest that we wish to use within the build. And um, it then kind of spiders out, starting at these binaries, discovering all the shared objects used along the way, and encoding this kind of graph of information as a Bazel build file that exposes targets. So on the slide here, we see um, the dependencies for a dynamically linked binary like LS. We see the inputs to our tool, uh, which is actually Starlark, where we pretty much give it paths of binaries to look at. Uh, when running the tool, it goes and emits a BZL file. And uh, this BZL file contains a representation of this graph that uh, essentially, when used, stands up targets that um, encode um, dependencies on the binaries as well as their shared object depths. And uh, finally, on the bottom right there, we have um, our gen rule again but this time annotated with its dependency on bash and env. And in practice, we would, of course, abstract the stuff away by having some kind of wrapper around gen rule and not forcing everybody to uh, you know, list out their dependency on bin env and individual POSIX binaries, but it's for the sake of illustration. Uh, uh, so that's a good segue into the next source of, uh, next common source of implicit dependencies, and that's uh, shell and POSIX binary depths. So there are a couple of common sources of this. Um, for shell, there is general. There are rules that call um, actions run shell. And um, another one is actually the use of um, built-in shell scripts um, inside of many common basal rule sets. Uh, I think one of the prominent um, examples of this is the test setup script, which every test rule uh, depends on and invokes. So uh, these, of course, have implicit dependencies on, for example, the date binary um, that uh, need to be modeled. So the tack we took, um, at least today, was to use wrapper macros that uh, exploit the fact that uh, in BZL files, you can actually go override implicit um, attributes. So things with an underscore, they just get mapped to this dollar sign thing, so you can't override them in build files, but can elsewhere. Um, so we pretty much just use kind of wrapper macros to get around this problem. Uh, it's very easy to imagine better solutions, though, uh, as a first order, maybe label flags inside of Bazel that allow for overriding these things. And even better than that would be toolchains. And we already have a couple, um, sh toolchain and rule shell for dependency on the system um, shell, and uh, rule sh for uh, POSIX binaries. Um, one other kind of uh, graph that uh, is present is uh, language ecosystem packages. Uh, this is maybe a bit specific to our use case. We needed to expose a system package installation, but wanted to do so in a granular fashion. Um, and the motivation here is mostly to capture the static graph. We, we took or this information about dependencies in the static graph. We took a similar tack as with shared objects and um, came up with tooling to automate this. Uh, there are also a couple of other extra upsides of actually doing the work of detailing this information. The obvious one is you have a pretty strong correctness guarantee. But I think uh, having the information um, accessible in this graph format also has some upsides. In our case, it also provided for a good incremental tool cleanup story um, in that we were able to consult the graph to find offenders, find tools that were actually depending on these absolute paths and fix them up incrementally. OK, so finally, we have our takeaways. So first off, I want to stress that this is not prescriptive. I do not think um, I, this made sense for us because we had special requirements, uh, namely that we had um, tools with undesirable behavior that weren't really in our control. In practice, if you're using well-supported tooling and aren't struggling with hermeticity, there isn't a need for this kind of thing. Um, and also, the kind of um, approaches detailed here aren't an argument against making your tools better. 
there is definite upside to going that approach. The user experience is better and so forth. All of that said, I do think it's worth contrasting this approach with existing ways of enforcing hermeticity past what the sandbox can offer in Bazel today. So today, I think the onus is largely on tools, rule sets, and out-of-band solutions. So one kind of attack you can take is to get your tools to conform to the Bazel ideal. This means relative paths everywhere. And um, I think one example um, of enforcing um, hermeticity past what the sandbox offers that I really like is actually in rule CC. So there is um, machinery there that actually um, post compiler execution makes sure that you did not include any headers by absolute path. So on the right here, we have an example of us doing so. And uh, underneath it, we have the error message that Bazel will spit out. So what I think is really interesting about this is that um, it's essentially papering over a deficiency of the sandbox using cooperation from the tool and the rule set. So in this case, uh, the tool, GCC and Clang, uh, they need to go emit information, letting um, Bazel know that uh, what headers have been included. To be fair, they already had this in the form of .d files. But rule set authors actually have to go use this to um, guarantee correctness. Um, another kind of attack folks take um, that I've seen is to use an out-of-band approach to provide hermeticity. I think a couple of good examples of this are containers. So approaches like Dazel, where you go run um, your Bazel build inside of a Docker container. Uh, and also, I think, in uh, recent years, we've seen people leverage uh, Nix and Nix packages for their tools more and more, uh, I think in part because of the strong um, kind of hermeticity guarantees that that ecosystem has. So I think um, in contrast to the um, stricter sandboxing solution described in this talk, um, I sorry, what we're really selling here is a uh, kind of structured approach to enforcing hermeticity. I think the big difference between um, the approaches detailed on the previous slide and the extensions described here are that uh, you kind of get a um, stronger guarantee that doesn't require understanding your tools very well. Um, and obviously, this is kind of specific to our use case. Not every use case needs this kind of thing. Um, but I suspect there are also maybe some other places where having this extra information or having this ability to enforce hermeticity would be useful. I've listed a couple of examples on this slide, but honestly, I'm more curious to know what the community thinks and whether other people have run into examples where they have desired this. So the, uh, these slides, uh, all the code within the slides, the fork that I've been describing are all available on GitHub at these links. And uh, my name is Rahul Bhutani. I'm on the Bazel Slack. And my email is here. And uh, I would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts about this stuff. Uh, I think we have maybe one minute for questions. Yeah, cool talk. Thanks. Um, sure. Curious your thoughts. I've had personal success with the out of band solution. Have you labeled it with Nix? I didn't quite understand. Uh, knowing the two, why did you approach one versus the other? And how yeah. might you think about that? Because the end result seems very similar-ish, but you've taken a lot of the work up front of kind of yeah, doing yeah. what it might give you. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So in our case, uh, the choice was kind of made for us. Um, we have you know HPC style environment running Nix. Um, Nix as of today still requires root, so um, it, you know it's kind of a non-starter. I know things like Nix Portable exist, but it's uh, the user experience is not quite there in my opinion. But um, in general, I think. Um, Honestly, I think some of the talks that folks will be giving tomorrow will do a really good job answering your question about what some of the trade-offs around uh, leading into this kind of Nix plus Bazel approach are. But uh, in our case, yeah, the decision was kind of made for us.